When Horikoshi Sensei sat down to write this chapter of My Hero Academia, he thought to himself, you know what this series needs? It needs more hands, more body horror. That's exactly what Horikoshi Sensei probably thought to himself when he was writing and drawing this chapter. Like, seriously, I've seen a lot of the community discussion recently talking about how it seems Horikoshi Sensei is inspired by Akira to make the type of drawings that is depicting Shigaraki in these latest chapters, but in my personal opinion, looking at, like, recent stuff that's been happening online and what's been really making waves throughout the entire community through gaming, anime, etc., Elden Ring. Everybody has probably heard the title Elden Ring mentioned at least once or twice in the past few weeks, and when I look at Shigaraki's situation, it reminds me a lot of Godric the Grafted. Like, there is same energy level being channeled through Shigaraki and Godric, and it's just like, yeah, I I do wonder. I, I really do wonder if Horikoshi Sensei is a fan of a Souls game or something, because it's like, we don't really know, but when I just I look at Shigaraki's design, it really does look something straight out of like a berserk, you know, manga panel, or something out of what, say, a Souls game. That's just what vibes I get from Shigaraki. But anyways, with that out of the way, let's talk about this chapter, because it's a pretty meaty chapter. There is a lot, actually, in this chapter. I know at first appearances, when you look at the chapter, it's a quick read. It really is. It's a, it's a really quick read. But when you dive into the nitty-gritty, you look at each individual panel and kind of what's going on, there is a bit. There is a lot of content. Like, we have the stuff, obviously, with Shigaraki's body and the mutation. We have stuff with Monoma. We have Moonfish reappearance. We have another character that reappears as well that's from an anime filler episode. We got the stuff with Toga. We got Danger Sense. We got a lot going on throughout the chapter. There's a lot of things to wonder about. I mean, even Quirk Singularity. There's so much. So it's a pretty good chapter. So I know many probably want me to talk about maybe the Toga stuff, because, I mean, that's a really important segment of the chapter, especially that final line from Toga at the end, which I will talk about, do not worry. But I think I want to focus on Shigaraki and Quirk Singularity first. Let's start from the beginning of the chapter, and let's make my way towards the end of the chapter. So, Quirk Singularity. A term that we have heard many times before in the past while reading and watching My Hero Academia. It is not something that just appeared in this chapter. It is something that has been dropped multiple times throughout the story for a very long time. For years now, slowly information is sprinkled in by Horikoshi Sensei himself, and we got to know a little bit more about it. Now, before these chapters obviously came out, you know, our general understanding of Quark Singularity was pretty high, but we didn't understand the full extent of it, and we get a little bit more of the darker aspects of what a Quark Singularity actually is. But let's kind of go over what we know so far before this chapter. We knew that Quark Singularity was a point to where Quarks were going to evolve to a point to where it was like a second evolution of Quarks, because we gotta remember when Quarks appeared, they were a mutation on the human body. Every individual person that lives in My Hero Academia, if you're not Izuku that was born Quarkless, has a genetic mutation to where you're gifted a quirk to be able to have like a superpower and this was something that really changed how the world worked and it really just everything changed for you know good and worse depending on your perspectives of the actual world and the point though is is that with this mutation kind of obviously circulating and becoming the main common I guess body for humans eventually there would probably be another mutation and that's where quirk singularity came in as more and more children are born and you have these quirks you know mixing with other quirks, eventually there's going to be mutations to where a new quirk is going to form, and they're going to be much more powerful than the predecessors of the original quirk users, and that's kind of where Todoroki comes in. Todoroki is a good example of just like quirk singularity, or a stepping stone to that exact point of a quirk singularity, because Todoroki is a perfect mixture of his mother and father, and he is able to use fire and ice, and this shows that quirks are able to mix and become a lot stronger through the the, you know, individual's children. Now, obviously, there's extreme cases to where, like, the children of the mother and father, they have a completely different quirk that is not the exact same. For instance, we have seen stuff like, you know, for instance, Shigaraki, or we have seen stuff through, let's say, you know, Eri. There is many quirks that have appeared that just come out of nowhere, and they're completely different from, let's say, their parents. And so, we know that there is mutations like this that can actually happen. So, you never really know what type of quirk an individual is going to have until it actually, you know, awakens, which leads to a lot of problems within these, you know, different individuals. For instance, what's happened to Shigaraki, what's happened to Toga, etc. And that kind of 
extends to the newer point. For instance, we also got to find out that quark singularities were quarks evolved to such a point to where they gain sentience. We have seen this through One for All, we have seen this through All for One, and to some extent we have seen this also from Star and Stripe. We have seen quarks evolve to a point to where they're actually able to have somewhat of sentience, consciousness to a certain degree, which really just shows how much evolution is going on within the story. But now we get to see it's not just quarks evolving, but also the body. The human body itself is evolving, and we have seen effects to on the negative side, especially from Izuku, and now we're seeing the negative effects from Shigaraki, and what I mean by this is, it was stated that if, you know, you receive one for all, if you're not, let's say, quarkless, you know, it's probably going to kill you. That That's what was stated by a previous user of one for all to Izuku, and so we now know that one for all is going to come to a point to where it's eventually not going to be able to be passed on because there might not be any quarkless individuals because the power is just going to be too strong and it's going to, you know, end somebody. While you have Shigaraki as someone that was a quarkless and he was given all for one. With all these mutations, all these quarks, all this power, we're getting to see his body really trying to handle that immense amount of power that is inside of him, especially when he has a regen quark that is not technically allowing him to die. So there's a lot to unbox with that, but we get two extreme examples of what a quark could do to a body when it accumulates too much power. And speaking of power, this is something I talked about in the past. I've talked about hypothetically, if we're going on a hypothetical and like we're going really far into the future, if One for All was able to be passed on for countless generations, for a very, very long time, hundreds of years basically, there might come a point to where One for All would be so strong that literally moving a finger could potentially wipe out an entire city. That's what I've talked about because of how One for All is, how it stocks up, you know, power, stockpiles. And that's kind of what is with One for All, how strong it can be, and how dangerous it can be in the future, and why, you know, each individual user just gets stronger, why Isaku is able to be stronger than All Might. So, that that's something else to consider, that quarks are just getting so astronomically strong that eventually they can become potential planet busters. That's how ridiculous it potentially could be. But let's ground it back down to reality for a second, and let's talk about Shigaraki and what's going on with his body. So, we see Monoma try to erase, you know, uh, what Shigaraki's going on with the groves to, you know, decay, etc. We see Monoma trying to do stuff, but obviously it isn't successful. Shigaraki's hands are growing at an exponential rate, and they're not being stopped whatsoever. And what this pretty much is, is that Shigaraki's body is evolving. It's mutating to a point to where it's not even a quark anymore, it's something else entirely. And you could kind of say that this is the next step for quark evolution. For instance, quark singularity. That the body of Shigaraki is mutating because it cannot die. For instance, imagine this. Hypothetically, Shigaraki at this point probably, if he did not have the region quirk, he probably would be dead because his body is mutating to such an extent it's causing irreparable damage to his overall skeletal structure that he'd probably die if he did not have region. So if that was destroyed, he would die. And that's why he is able to mutate to such an extent, is because his body is not dying, and so you just see, like, this cancerous growth just forming on him and mutating and allowing his body to go to a different direction, and he's becoming monstrous because it's not a gradual shift, it's happening at a very fast rate. So that's what's kind of going on with Shigaraki. His body is mutating to keep up with the overall power that is contained within his body, but his body's pretty much on a constant state of crisis to where it's dying and living, dying and living, Living. That's my two cents on that of what's actually going on, but let's actually consider a few things, okay? So let's say Monoma isn't able to erase Shigaraki. What's going on right now? There might come a point where Shigaraki's overall evolution could surpass the original quarks, where its power of the original quarks can no longer even recognize what Shigaraki is technically capable of. Like, okay, I think everybody knows about genetics, etc. You know, eventually genetics will change to such a degree that maybe certain things will no longer work on that individual. If, like, you know, 
DNA and stuff changes. And theoretically, thanks to the mutations going on in Shigaraki, his DNA could be so radically different at this point and the shift in everything to where he probably might not have a racer work on him much longer if the mutations continue to happen. That is something to factor in because his quirk is probably mutating past what original quirks actually are. So yeah, that is food for thought. Well, let's back up for a second and let's talk about his hands and decay. So all those hands on Shigaraki, if a racer stops working, could potentially cause decay. And the level of destruction that would happen from that is ungodly. Like, I cannot even begin to imagine how much would get destroyed if Eraser wasn't activated right now because of just the sheer mass of the amount of hands. Like, literally the entirety of the floating structure of UA would probably cease to exist in a matter of seconds if Eraser was not actually activated, which gets into the main point. Monoma is in the spotlight, and I talked about this in my video I made a few days ago, that Monoma, seeing him in the spotlight makes me very happy. He's pretty much the main character at this point. Like, the main front and center spotlight without Monoma, everything comes undone, everybody dies. That's literally how important Monoma is. And his overall interactions within this chapter and saying, like, I'm doing it right, I'm doing it right, you know, I'm still looking, why is it not working? Him overall freaking out shows that he is a greenhorn. He's inexperienced. He isn't, you know, a, a well-veteran hero. He's not someone that's been on the front lines a lot. He is still a teenager that is not able to properly assess a lot of situations. His overall reaction says that. And I feel like the sheer fear that he might feel from Shigaraki might actually cause him to blink. I don't think he is someone that would be able to keep his eyes open if Shigaraki was to turn towards him and try to come after him like what happened with, you know, Eraser Aizawa. I don't think the same thing would happen. So there is a lot of things to consider. I feel like Monoma is not a danger dangerous situation, and if he blinks, everybody dies. The amount of trauma, the amount of, I guess, guilt he would have if he was to blink would be out of this world, and it's pretty interesting to think about what would happen if that indeed does happen, since this is technically considered the final arc, or the final war arc, there is a likely possibility that could happen, and a lot of characters could actually, you know, die. But, uh, yeah, I think I've talked about that enough. Let's talk about the other sections. So, we have, you know, the stuff going on on the island with Ochiko and Moonfish and all of them. Let, let, let's talk about that. So, Moonfish reappeared in this chapter, and you get to see where he makes some damage on Gang Orca. You see some brief damage in his arm, and I want everybody to remember that Moonfish isn't weak. He was someone in the past that was able to hold off Todoroki, and I believe Bakugo at the exact same time. I could be wrong with that one, but he was able to to actually hold off very strong individuals by himself, and that, that really says a lot. He is a really capable fighter, and getting to see him back in the story makes me very happy because he's getting utilized. He is a strong villain that definitely isn't kind of like a throwaway. I do wonder if Mustard would actually reappear as well that we saw in that exact same arc since Muscular's already appeared, now Moonfish has appeared. I would like to see Mustard actually make a reappearance. And speaking of appearances or reappearances, we have a filler character from the anime make an official canon appearance in the manga. So, what this pretty much lets me know, and I think many of us readers, that Horikoshi is saying that the anime filler episodes on My Hero Academia are indeed canon. That That's exactly what I got from that. So, that is some food for thought. So, interesting that we got to see the Sailor Girl actually make an appearance in this chapter and fighting on the front lines. Now, speaking of fighting, let's talk about Ochiko. So Ochiko, she uh she confesses to Izuku by saying, I want you to be my boyfriend. And this entire scene is scary, hilarious, and just like, oh my goodness. It really just goes to show how bonkers, you know, Toga is, that she is not able to comprehend and understand the situation at hand. It's the exact same thing that happened with Ochiko when she was worrying about Gagan running through the entirety of a city. It's like Obviously, Toga can't comprehend the severity of the situation and what's going on, and she is so self-centered, so selfish about what she wants. She doesn't care about the others around her, and she wants her gratification, her satisfaction over anyone else's. And so, seeing her say that to Izuku just shows that she hasn't changed one bit. In fact, she's gotten a little bit more straightforward and a lot worse with what she says within this chapter. Now, do I feel like, you know, Toga is going to win. 
No, I feel like, theoretically, Izuku should be able to quickly just demolish Togo in an instant. I mean, we know All for One or in One for All are completely different levels of quirks, and One for All, which is Izuku's quirk, is insanely broken. He is able to go in and just wipe people out. He's stronger than All Might pretty much right now, so he should be able to handle Togo with relative ease, even if Sad Man Parade was to make an appearance, which we know will make an appearance since Toga has, you know, twice his blood. But that, that's the point I'm trying to make is, is I really do feel like, uh, you know, Toga's not really much of a challenge for Izuku. Even if he can't use Danger Sense to see where she's at, he should be able to kind of deal with her. But obviously this entire obstacle or this fight isn't necessarily about bringing down Toga. It's more of trying to understand what's going on with Toga and potentially save her. This is going to bring, you know, Izuku's morality into question. You know, is he willing to kill a villain? Is he not willing to kill a villain? And so this is going to lead to a lot of development for Toga and probably guarantee what action or what what side she's going to fall on. Is she going to be a villain? Is she going to be a hero, an anti-hero, an anti-villain? You don't really know, but the point is, is that Toga's situation is very delicate right now, and depending on Izuku's response is what's going to happen with Toga, and if, you know, whatever happens to Toga is probably going to be the response for Shigaraki. So, that is something interesting, but Danger Sense, though, not working, I guess it makes sense. I guess it lets us know that it's about empathy and it's about intent. Like, for instance, if you have ill intent, you know, Danger Sense will activate, but if you don't, then it will not activate quite a... You know, it's a useful quirk, but it's not useful if someone's kind of psychotic. That That's definitely something we got from this chapter of My Hero Academia, but that's pretty much about it. It's a good chapter. Cannot wait to read more. Cannot wait for next week. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. How you felt about this week's chapter of My Hero Academia. Be honest in the comments below. I am very curious. And what was your favorite part? What was your favorite panel? You know, let me know. But if you enjoy my content, you know, please subscribe. Please leave a like. It does help me out a lot. But with that, guys, be safe. Stay healthy. Chibi out.